Good morning everyone, my name is Annabelle and I'm one of the leaders at Woody Baptist. And last week Stu did an excellent job of wrapping up this series of Amos that we've been doing and talking about the main challenges that it presents to us. And I'm delighted to be kicking off our summer mini-series on Psalms this morning. Next week Lydia from YWAM will be bringing a message personal to what she feels God is saying. And then Stu, Marv and Justin will all be bringing another psalm to consider throughout August. So the psalm I've chosen to speak on is my and probably many people's favourite, Psalm 23. So let's read it now. Firstly, let's pray. Father, just ask that you would bless your word to us this morning. Give us ears to hear what you want to say to us. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Such a well-known psalm that the danger is that the words just wash over us and we don't really consider the truth of what David is saying. So I hope to draw you into it a bit further, but I'll also spend some more time at the end rereading it prayerfully because it is such a beautiful piece of writing. So firstly, as I've mentioned, it is written by David, who we know was a shepherd himself. And so he really understands in a way that most of us, I presume, wouldn't what it involves to be a shepherd, what it means to be completely responsible and accountable for the sheep's hunger, thirst and well-being. He saw it as an apt description of how God cares for us. A shepherd is not ethereal, abstract or mystic. A shepherd is real, close, involved and reachable. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Most scholars think he wrote this psalm when he was a teenager working as a shepherd for his father. A good reminder that youth doesn't mean that you can't be a giant slayer and it doesn't mean you can't know God in a profound way. <clears throat> it's interesting to me that in Old Testament times, shepherd was a widely used metaphor for king in the Near East and Israel. So perhaps it's not surprising that David comes easily to this metaphor. However, by Jesus' time, shepherds were viewed as unclean and lowly, and yet Jesus still described himself as the good shepherd in John 10, verse 11 to 18, when he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. The Lord is my shepherd. Verse one goes on to say, I shall not be in want or I shall not lack. I have to admit, I struggle with this part, thinking surely there are Christians in the world who are lacking things they need. For myself, I can honestly say that I've never lacked anything in God. Even in hard times, he has shown me countless small mercies so that I know that he's with me. But clearly it doesn't mean that everything is all fine. It wasn't fine for David a lot of the time. I suspect this verse is more to do with our perception of need compared to God's perception. If we take this verse at face value, then if we don't currently have something, we don't need it. When you're looking at your life through the lens of eternity and of closeness with God being the only thing that really matters, then indeed we do lack nothing, for he has given us everything in Jesus. 
It's not necessarily what the world gives, but it's what we need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Next, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Green pastures for sheep are life-giving and essential for refreshment and well-being. God feeds us. How? By his word. He feeds our souls with regular meals and a balanced diet, if only we will partake by his word. Eating on the run is not healthy. I always feel that there's a little warning in these verses with the word make. In my experience, if we refuse to look after ourselves properly, whether that's physically, emotionally, work balance or spiritually, then he will make us lie down. For me, that looked like burnout in my mid-twenties and learning some great lessons about my worth and my needs. He will make us lie down, better to do it in a timely manner. He leads me beside quiet waters. Sheep can't drink safely at waterfalls and rushing waters. We need to be quiet sometimes. I wonder how many of us have the odd moment of missing lockdown. Not all of us, for sure, but for some, it was a chance to slow down. But more importantly, what are we drinking? What are these waters? Well, we see it in John 7, verses 37 to 39. It says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So as he feeds us in the green pastures of his word and gives us the calm water of his spirit, he restores our souls. David needed that. He was an adulterer and a murderer. We also need our souls restoring. Sheep get cuts and bruises and need healing, and so do we. As we come into his green pastures, we can find restoration for our souls and rest in God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Then it says he guides me. It's not sometimes he guides me or he has guided me. It is a certain and ongoing fact. Shepherds lead sheep in good pathways. God leads us in good pathways by his word. He will guide us. But the paths of righteousness are not always the easiest or the quickest, but rather the ones that take us closest to him because we bear his name and as name bearers, we need to honour him. I read that the sheep on the hillsides of Israel circle their way to the top and eventually form a path that leads them higher. Simmons, who wrote um, the Passion Translation of, of Psalms, which should highly recommend reading as a sort of added extra, he says, each step we take following our shepherd will lead us higher, even though it may seem we are going in circles. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And now we come to a valley. A valley is deep, dark and dirty, but it is also a fruitful place. And this valley has the shadow of death. I always thought it was a curious expression and the way that it's written depends on what translation you read. But certainly the one, the NIV that I've grown up with mentions the shadow of death, but a shadow is not real, it's not actual death. I think this is talking more about the fear of death than death itself especially as it goes on to say, I will fear no evil. Grief, illness, disappointment and loss are unavoidable in this fallen world, but a shadow means that light exists somewhere. We can cling on to that, on to the fact that he says that he is with us. Often the real problem in a situation is fear. We may be facing illness, for example, but it's the fear of the consequences that holds the real sting. To learn to fear no evil is a powerful thing. I'm not saying it's easy, 
but I can testify that at the hard times in my life, God certainly felt very close. His word says we walk through the valley. We won't get lost or stuck. Death can kill the body, but it can't kill the soul and he is with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So what is a rod and a staff? Well, the shepherd used the staff for support and the rod was used to guide sheep, rescue them, protect them from predators, count them. These are the tools of the trade that gave the shepherd authority and the ability to care for the sheep. They comfort us because we know that God has all authority and all ability to care for us. And then we have a change of scene where we're no longer sheep, but we are sat at a table prepared for us by God. He has anointed our head with oil and our cup overflows. This speaks of incredible honour as we sit as guests at the Lord's feast. We are given dignity and we are chosen to sit with him. This should bring us to our knees in praise for his wonderful grace. For what have we done to deserve this? Nothing. It is all because of what Jesus did on the cross that means that we can be invited to this table. And it's not just us and God in the room. We're in the presence of our enemies. This is talking not about humans, but about the demons and evil powers that set themselves against us. The enemies of our soul stand around, watching on as God chooses us, saves us, honours us and delights in us. Jesus has broken all of their power. It's a good reminder in this psalm that the world isn't just us and God, it's us and God and Satan. And this is a good description, one that I love, of how ultimately he's beaten. I'm sure you might have heard this, this story, this image, and I've shared it uh, recently in church um, in the ministry room, um, a picture of a snake who has had its head chopped off. So it is dead in that sense, but uh, a bit like when you cut the head of a chicken, um, the, the snake body writhes around uh, for a while and causes destruction as it does as it does so and I've always found that quite helpful a picture of how although the enemy still co is causing chaos he has been defeated his head has been cut off so it says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David has moved from acknowledging that he lacks nothing to a far more positive statement that goodness and love will follow him every day of his life. What a wonderful picture. He has confidence in the character of God and so he knows that the life ahead of him is secure. I hope that well, I know that he, you know, he clung to that all through his life. We see it in all the Psalms that he wrestles, he questions, but he knows who God is. Because if he is saying this Psalm as a teenager, he's got a lot of life ahead of him. But he knows he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Clearly, he has some sense of eternity, even though he wrote this before the resurrection happened. We too can have the same assurance if you don't know that you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, please get in touch as we would love to talk with you about this. So what questions does this pose for us? I think there are several. Firstly, do you really believe you have everything you need? Are you grateful for what you have? Secondly, green pastures and quiet waters are there for the taking. I've talked many times about the importance of, of soul time, taking time out. How much are you craving stuff or people that don't really satisfy when actually it's our time with God and in the spirit that does? Also, what has wounded your soul? In what way do you need restoring? Next, can you trust that the path that you're on is guided by his hand? And who do you know in a valley of shadows at the moment? Can you pray for them and walk with them? 
And lastly, do you know that you have every spiritual blessing and that your enemies are defeated? How do you think about the future? Talk to God, talk to each other, talk to me about your thoughts on these things. So to end, when I was praying about this preach, I felt that I should pray this psalm over us as a church, not just individuals. So that is what I'll do now to finish. The Lord is Woody's shepherd. He is looking after us. We shall not be in want. Even though we are in an interregnum, we're feeling weary perhaps, or whatever it might be, we lack nothing. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He feeds us by his word every single week or as much as we want it. He leads us beside quiet waters. He has given us his spirit. He restores our soul. Where we are in need of restoration, he will do it if we let him. He guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He has guided us strongly in recent times and he will continue to do so. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for he is with us. His rod and his staff comfort us. We have had loss, but we fear not because we know God is with us with authority and capable care. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil, our cup overflows. God has chosen us, given us honour and is so, so good to us. Surely goodness and love will follow Woody all the days of its life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.